The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning. Thank you to all of you who have joined us today to discuss the role of policing in ending mass incarceration. My name is Cami McElhenney and I serve as the Director of Training and Education for the National Association for Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement. I just wanted to welcome you and discuss a few logistics of today's webinar. All of you have entered the call in listen-only mode. At any time, however, you may type in any questions you might have for Dr. Neustetter. When we come to the question and answer portion of the webinar, your questions will be asked by myself. And during the webinar, you may also send any questions you might have for me as a webinar administrator, administrator and in the same manner, and I will answer your questions as quickly as possible. Now, I would like to turn things over to Jana Lewis. Jana is the Deputy Ombuds at the King County Office of the Ombuds. She is also a member at large of the NACOL Board of Directors. Jana? Thanks, Cami. Hi, everyone. As Cami said, my name is Jana Lewis. I am uh, one of the NACOL board members. One of my responsibilities, along with my co-chair, Flo Finkel, is the Training Education and Standards Committee, which brings you um, webinar content such as this one today. One of the things that we do in oversight very frequently is look at things downstream. We look at things at after the event happened um, and, and look backwards to see, was the training appropriate? Was the action itself appropriate? The supervision appropriate? And things like that. What we're gonna talk about today is shifting that focus a little bit and seeing if there's ways that we can look at um, these same things from a more up the stream perspective. And to do that today is Dr. Rebecca Neustetter. She has dedicated her career to advancing equity in their criminal justice and healthcare systems. She focuses on reducing criminal justice contact, disparities, um, and collater collateral consequences. She works to enhance public safety, civic participation, and opportunities to support health and vitality. Rebecca previously served as the Vera Institute of Justice's founding police, policing program director. Prior to that, she served as the director of research policy and planning for the New York Police Department. She holds a PhD in criminal justice from the John Jay College of the Graduate Center, and she is currently the executive director at the University of Chicago Health Lab. If you want more information about her, her full bio is on our the NACOL website. To you, Rebecca. Thank you, Jana. Thank you, Cami, And thank you so much, everybody who's joining us uh, across the, the country today for this conversation. I'm really excited to, to be here with you all virtually to discuss the role of police in ending mass incarceration. When we talk about mass incarceration, we often think about things that occur downstream from police, lots of cor corrections and court processing reforms that have been advanced. Um, however, it, it's quite logical that uh, mass incarceration actually begins with police and police enforcement and by way can, can, can end and be minimized through the role of police. Um, and NACOL and civilian oversight generally really plays an important and large role uh, in, in sort of understanding how this work can advance and how we can improve the, the oversight and uh, efforts of, of police and enforcement in our country. As we all know, mass incarceration is really caused by mass arrests. But this work, which I'll discuss in more detail today, uh, in order to attempt to understand the pathway from police involvement to incarceration, really hasn't been studied or understood, or the opportunities to alter this pathway. So that arrests and incarceration are only implied to those circumstances and to those people in which enforcement and arrests and incarceration are absolutely necessary. I think all of us can agree that uh, incarceration is over applied and arrests are over applied in this country. And this has become a bipartisan, really non-controversial topic. Um, uh, and I'll discuss this a little bit further, but 
I think we um, need to keep front and central the disastrous consequences that result from arrests and incarceration. And even what one might consider to be minimal involvement in a police enforcement action can have very long term devastating effect effects to an individual, their family and their communities. Um, so really importantly, before I go forward with the presentation, I want to uh, note that I approached this work from the perspective that I believe that American policing is over-reliant on enforcement and that this default to enforcement has caused two of society's biggest challenges. It's caused mass incarceration, but importantly, it's also caused really frayed relationships, and I say frayed at best, in some instances, even toxic relationships between many police departments, police officers in this country, and the communities for which they are uh, supposed to serve and protect, particularly communities of color. So to put this in context, let's look at this relationship a little bit more closely. Uh, in ending American policing's over-reliance on enforcement, again, it causes these really frayed, sometimes even toxic relationships, but enforcement also causes mass incarceration. Um, and, and when we talk about incarceration, many people are very familiar with the statistics, but what, what I've learned over the course of my career is that many, many people don't really understand how widely applied arrests are. Um, and the most recent data that we have available estimates nationally that there are about 10.5 million arrests that are made every single year in the United States. This equates to about one arrest every three seconds. And while we hope that these arrests are occurring to keep us safer and in response to serious and violent crimes, that's actually really far from the case. Less than 5% of all arrests over the past 30 plus years have been for a serious violent crime. Um, more importantly, enforcement is not evenly applied across the US population. Enforcement's applied more in certain parts of the country, in, su in suburbs and in rural areas oftentimes, over more so than in cities. And most importantly, enforcement and arrests are applied more often to people of color. So in fact, one in two young black men will have been arrested in this country by the time they turn 23 years old. So to put a spotlight on policing, for, for a moment, uh, we think about the uh, police officers as really the gatekeepers of the entire criminal justice system. They hold almost exclusive authority by way of issuing citations, arrests, and even applying physical force to enforce and regulate the law. But when people and communities call on the police for help in order to maintain order, to respond to crimes that may be occurring or to resolve community problems like homelessness, substance use, or even interfamilial disputes, the police too often employ a set of punishing responses. Um, and so if we think about 911 and 911 calls for service as the way in which police are most often intersecting and being involved in our communities, it opens up a, a, a really big pathway for which we can understand and provide oversight to, to police activities, uh, but also gives us an opportunity for which we can actually minimize police response and by way of doing so, minimize arrests and minimize enforcement. So 911 calls for service, and I'll discuss this a little bit more in, in detail in a few minutes, but 911 is essentially the gateway to the entire criminal justice system. But yet we have very little understanding about why the police are being called um, and whether or not they, the police are indeed the best responders uh, to the, these problems that are being initiated through 911 calls. Uh, but, but by the police coming, we, we see that they are, um, are oftentimes punitive enforcement actions that are unnecessary, that are being applied, and that there are attendant collateral consequences that result from that. 
If somebody's uh, arrested, they're very likely to lose their employment, which by way, uh, they may lose their housing. Uh, certain arrests may uh, impact people's parental rights or their ability to adopt and foster children. Um, it can cut off access to benefits and other supplements. So uh, arrests and incarceration have a huge impact on people's opportunities to be attached to, to civil society and to the support networks. Um, but what we also know is that arrests and incarceration do not in itself uh, just automatically improve public safety and that there are instances in which we actually may be making public safety worse by, by, by implementing these enforcement activities. So by understanding and uh, determining what the underlying causes of these calls for service are, we can begin to fundamentally solve these problems in a way that doesn't necessarily bring the police to bear. Um, and, and when we, we do need the police to, to respond, by looking at the 911 um, calls for service data, we can understand how to send the right responders at the right time, rather than defaulting to the current norm, which basically sends the closest officer to respond to a problem with lights and sirens and adrenaline pumping and potentially even guns uh, ablazing. And that's just not in the best interest of public safety and has really dire consequences. Um, so if we uh, can move to the next slide, um, just to, to sort of further put this into context, between 1980 and 2017, we saw a major spike in jail admissions and arrests. Um, although arrests in the, the late 2000s did start to decline. However, based on the ways in which many governments uh, started to respond to criminal justice policies, uh, it became much more likely that individuals would be admitted into jail who were arrested. Uh, so throughout the course of the past several decades, uh, it, it's clear that police enforcement has uh, oftentimes become a direct expressway to jail. Um, and then moving on to the next slide, um, the, we know that, that officers are quite limited um, in the responses that they have available to them. This uh, graphic before you is, is sort of a, a visual representation of what most police officers uh, have available to them in order to respond to an incident. One of the, the sort of biggest options is to do nothing, to turn the other cheek and the person goes free and then there's no criminal record. Um, officers also have the opportunity to redirect uh, the situation to another responding agency. Um, they can issue a citation and release the person to appear in court uh, at a later date or to, to, to pay some sort of fine or fee. Uh, but usually in response to that, the individual is pleading guilty to some sort of violation or charge. Of, of course, an officer can make a custodial arrest, of which we see that there are over 10 million of those made every single year. Uh, an officer can issue a warning, a, a verbal warning or a written warning, and the person goes free and uh, oftentimes has no criminal record attached to that involvement. Um, and finally, uh, an officer can refer an individual to community-based treatment, uh, wherein the individual's underlying needs can be assessed and addressed through services and programming. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the referrals and redirecting to other responding agencies is not a common practice in many of our jurisdictions across the country. And, We'll describe this a little bit more in terms of uh, recommendations that may be available, but we think that there are huge, huge opportunities in order to expand the, the use of some of these other tools in officer's toolbox. Um, so the, the real goal in, in the, the, this effort to reimagine policing and to, to sort of shift their responsibilities away from enforcement requires a big paradigm shift. 
And in doing so, uh, we've developed uh, through the course of our research, six different recommendations in which we feel like police can uh, be very central in reducing mass incarceration across the country. Um, and many of these recommendations uh, have a, a, a key operational component in which oversight entities can be quite useful. Um, so I'll go through each of these recommendations now, beginning first with, um, the idea that we can identify and promote and invest in alternatives to enforcement that don't involve the criminal justice system. This uh, seems like a basic recommendation and um, in many ways it is, but we know nationally that we are very underutilized and under capacity in terms of true alternatives to enforcement. Often when we talk about alternatives, we talk about al al alternatives to incarceration. And so those come into play much after an arrest and police involvement has happened. So to, to think about alternatives to enforcement, we wanna really think about crime prevention and diversion and deflection from police engagement altogether. Um, or in instances where the police are involved, to think about alternative measures like community drop-off centers that don't involve officers taking individuals to jails and other detention facilities or to courts where they receive arraignment. And, and very centrally, these alternatives try to promote an understanding of underlying issues that may have caused the police to be deployed and respond in the first place. So really understanding if there are mental health or behavioral health, substance abuse issues at play, um, and thinking about sort of large scale mediation. Many, many of the 911 calls for service that police are responding to have to do with family and neighborhood disputes, uh, which are, are problems that people are dealing with in the moment, but may really not be well solved by the police themselves. So turning now to, to the next recommendation, which I'll spend the, the majority of the time discussing, uh, this is an, an area of, of keen interest of, of mine and, and an area in which I think there's a, a huge underdeveloped uh, empirical and alternative strategy base to address. But again, this, this relates back to re-engineering the 911 system. And as I mentioned previously, the 911 system really is the gateway and the case management system for the entire criminal justice system. It records all of the police department's interactions in the community, um, often including even those interactions that uh, don't come from a, a community initiated call for service, but these, these data systems are often also keeping track of any self-initiated activities that the police may be involved in. Um, and what we do know, while um, the information is quite limited in regards to 911 systems, is that frontline police officers spend a huge portion of their time reactively responding to 911 calls and that the majority of these calls are unrelated to crimes in progress. And so we know that officers need a wide range of resources to respond effectively to these different needs, including clearly communicated and detailed information that's provided to them up front, as well as training to respond to emergency situations that involve mental health, substance use, other kinds of behavioral issues, as well as training on alternatives and traditional enforcement approaches. But we also need to understand whether or not police are the appropriate deployed resource in these instances. And I would argue in many cases they are not, um, and that we have really mismatched police training and, and interest and their mission with what is coming in through the 911 systems. Um, and that requires really a, a translation of basic information from the initial 911 call takers to law enforcement dispatchers and then uh, thereafter to officers who respond to the scene. 
Um, but but there really are there's a, an absence, there's a, a notable absence of evidence informed strategies for processing and responding to 911 calls. But we know that um, not doing this well contributes to the overuse of law enforcement resources, as well as officer frustration and misdirected service calls, as well as to harm um, to those of whom uh, unnecessarily come into contact with law enforcement and whose problems are not solved well by law enforcement or enforcement generally. Um, so, even though most police interactions uh, begin with a 911 call for service, uh, th 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 they're a big part of the, the sort of criminal justice and law enforcement oversight puzzle that has been totally under-examined, under-explored, and under-resourced. So this is a hugely important area, um, and I, I think a, a huge uh, value and, and role added for oversight entities in order to help advance this work meaningfully. Um, just to, to give a little bit more context to this, we think of 911 as, as something that's been around forever, and it's, it's actually a relatively new enterprise. In fact, the first 911 call uh, came from that red telephone on the right-hand side um, in 1968, but it wasn't until uh, 1999 that Congress formally established 911 as the nation's emergency calling number and, and mandated that 911 be in place everywhere across the country. Um, and, but, but since then, 911 has actually proven to be one of the most successful civic engagement public service announcement and education campaigns. We have somewhere in the range of about 250 million calls that are made to 911 every single year. But other than that sort of like sparse data about how approximately how many calls we received, there's there's really no other information that we we know about uh, the calls that are coming in. But we do know that the call processing is, is quite complex and, and confusing and that there are many, many people uh, that information filters through both in terms of audio records and then through computer records uh, that have to be translated in order for information to get out to the field um, to the law enforcement officers who are being deployed. Um, so if you, you see on the left hand side and many of us may remember from when we were kids or if you have kids at home now, the, the famous game of telephone where you, you start with one word and you go through a couple of different uh, people and rounds of this and the interpretation and the, the, the words end up being uh, changed quite significantly throughout the process. So here we see uh, the, the word starts with peas and then it goes to bees and then knees and then cheese and fleas. And while that might seem sort of comical, it is exactly what is happening through our 911 system in that an, an, an individual calls 911, they speak to a, a call taker who then records information information um, in the system that a dispatcher looks at and then relays to an officer. And then there may oftentimes be several other people that come um, in between those messages and what what re results is some really fractured pieces of information that end up being very hard to uh, to to, re to really put into action in a meaningful way. Um, we've seen some really awful examples of how this goes terribly wrong. One of the the most awful examples of this is the Tamir Rice case. If you listen to the audio transcript of the 911 caller that initially reached out to uh, the, 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 the call takers about Tamir Rice on the playground, uh, uh, multiple different instances throughout the call, the caller says that it's a, a young 
child who is probably playing with a fake gun. I think they use the, the word probably fake at least three times within the call. Uh, that information doesn't get imparted into the system in that way at all. Um, officers are sent out to a gun call. There's no um, information or context given that this is a young a young child. There's no information that this might be a toy, um, and you know we will we'll never know the counter effect of that, unfortunately. But I, I think it, it is safe to say that. Uh, officers who are being sent out on a gun call versus uh, a call where a child may be playing with a fake gun are going to approach the situation quite differently. Um, so to give just one more uh, example about how the 911 call for service process works, um, this is a very sort of simplified version of, of how 911 calls for service are processed. An individual call, uh, caller, community member dials 911, relays information, um, and that information then is provided to a call taker. The call taker is determining if the call is for police, fire, or medical. They're gathering and recording relevant information, communicating instructions to the caller. Uh, at the same time, there may be multiple callers that are reporting the same incident and or the original caller may call back several times, so you have a little bit of a feedback loop. In certain instances, you may have an automated emergency, emergency dispatch that occurs based on the nature of the call taker's assessment of the situation or that information goes to a dispatcher who assigns uh, call priority levels to the call and then also assigns a responding officer. Um, and then, you know, how the, the response and the deployment occurs uh, basically is shaped from that point in time um, when the patrol officer is deployed to the scene and they are there to keep the peace to take a report to provide instructions uh, that resolve the issue on the scene um, to call in other resources or often to do as we saw in the officer toolbox either to do nothing uh, issue a citation or to make an arrest so moving on now to the next recommendation uh, for, for which we believe that, that police and uh, police oversight agencies can uh, be instrumental in reducing mass incarceration is thinking about increasing the number and types of offenses that don't require punitive enforcement. And so law enforcement agencies actually have a great deal of discretion, as you all probably well know, to do nothing um, in response to calls for service or other complaints that might be driving arrest volume. Um, and thinking about some of those kinds of issues that have little impact on public safety, uh, infractions like liquor law violations, curfew violations, loitering, those are uh, some good examples of, of, of offenses that are high in volume and questionable as to whether or not an arrest actually has a positive impact. Uh, so, for example, between 2010 and 2016, those offenses alone comprised over 400,000 arrests. Um, uh, so, for, I'm sorry, for curfew violations and loitering, there were 430,000 arrests between 2010 and 2016, and there were more than 2.6 million arrests for liquor law violations. Uh, so these types of offenses clearly constitute a significant portion of arrest nationwide, but jurisdictions that are instituting such policies really need to con Firm whether or not these offenses drive overall arrests in their individual localities. We also need to be cognizant of unintended consequences when we start to think about changing uh, the, the ways in which enforcement is applied. Uh, many of us are familiar with the disproportionate effect that decriminalization of marijuana has had in many states and that we continue to see really disparate effects of uh, people of color being arrested and cited um, 
in, in instances where, where marijuana possession under certain instances is uh, legal. Um, and uh, we, we want to make sure in all of these cases that we are not in, enhancing disparities in the criminal justice system that already exist. But um, thinking about what is uh, constituting an, an, an arrest uh, is a really important uh, factor for us to be considering in all of our jurisdictions, which relates to the next rec recommendation, and that's to expand the reach of alternatives to arrest. Again, there's an expansive base across the country on alternative to incarceration programs but existing police diversion programs that truly reduce the, 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 the probability of arrest and citations are quite limited in scope and in application. And where they do exist, there tends to be pretty narrow eligibility criteria that restricts people who are alleged to commit low-level nonviolent offenses. Um, and so oftentimes people who have lengthier criminal histories or particularly those individuals who might be charged with a crime that could be considered violent or sexual in nature tend to be ineligible for these alternatives, which um, creates an, an issue of, of, of access. Um, and we, we also have seen that police officers may not be diverting people, even in circumstances when individuals have met all of the prerequisites or eligibility criteria for alternatives, which results in smaller programs than if all eligible people were participating. There is very little to to no oversight that I'm aware of uh, nationally about how police officers and departments are expanding and using alternatives to arrests that might be available at their dispo disposal. Um, and you know, this is important again because the majority of arrests nationwide are for minor offenses. These violations include things like drug possession, disorderly conduct, public drunkenness, vagrancy, loitering, curfew violations, and vandalism. And uh, there's a real strong possibility that alternative to punitive enforcement could um, really, uh, in these areas, reduce the burden of mass incarceration. <clears throat> and by doing so, that would also reduce the burden of collateral consequences of criminal justice contacts. Um, again, things like housing, employment, um, access to, to subsidies can be uh, greatly um, hindered by people's uh, contact with the criminal justice system. So, but most importantly, we need to make sure that police discretion is clearly operationalized and, and, and is, is limited and is um, overseen to ensure that it's being applied you know, fairly and appropriately. So, for example, uh, oversight entities and police authorities should define the circumstances in which officers should reroute cases to alternatives to arrest rather than um, keep these terms ambiguous or confusing. Uh, moreover, existing alternative to arrest programs really have just begun to scratch the surface in terms of who may be el eligible and who could benefit from such approaches. Um, so there's a lot of, of work and possibility to be uh, advanced in that area. In thinking about um, some structural uh, opportunities here. Um, as many of us know, enforcement is often a rewarded criteria within our law enforcement agencies. And so a, a key factor here, and again, this is an area I think that oversight entities could be incredibly helpful in um, rethinking how this can, can, can be tenable, is to create structural incentives for police to use alternatives. So rather than reward arrests by um, 
the, the, the variety of ways in which uh, arrests are rewarded today. Um, arrests tend to be considered as key criteria for promotional activities. Uh, they make officers oftentimes eligible for overtime. Um, th these pathways need to be really considered so that we're not providing perverse incentives for um, officers to make arrests when there isn't going to be a positive re return to public safety for that arrest to occur. And rank and file officers will really only begin to treat arrests as an outcome that have a broad negative collateral consequence uh, and, until the message is, is clear that this is not something that is prioritized and incenti incentivized. And leadership uh, and our, our communities really must back up those messages with policies and performance metrics that encourage and reward officers to use alternatives to punitive enforcement. And this could include everything from measuring levels of community satisfaction, trust, perceptions of safety, um, might also include things like the number of time officers refer someone to a community service provider instead of arresting them, and attaching these metrics to professional incentives and rewards. What law enforcement agencies choose to measure sends a very strong signal to both officers and the public about what is valued and important in policing. And so such a change would amount to a major shift in police culture, but one for which there really are no published examples from which agencies can learn. And there's huge opportunity here. What we know in you know, all of our systems is that we measure what matters to us. And so by encouraging creativity and collaboration and setting police policy, we uh, aim to avoid to default and, and reward enforcement-based responses. And then the final recommendation that I'll discuss today involves um, really investing further in finding out what works best through experimentation, research, and analysis. We spend a huge amount of money every single year on police services, um, but yet we have very little empirical understanding of what uh, actually works. And uh, many oversight agencies are leading the charge to, to, to try to have a, a better understanding and adherence to evidence-based practices. But we know that there uh, is more that can be done here and that the reasons why and what circumstances officers to default to enforcement, that these pathways are still very much unclear and that there's more that, that we need to, to do in order to learn about what alternative responses might work best and most importantly, for whom and why. Um, so, you know, the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll say here is that interventions that are aimed to reduce enforcement um, really can help achieve these goals, but we need to have a very focused and concerted effort to invest in the infrastructure and processes in order to collect and analyze arrest data in uniform ways so that we can compare this information across time, across agencies, across districts. Um, you know, for instance, we have really absolutely no understanding nationally uh, as it relates to police uh, enforcement uh, beyond arrests. There's no centralized information about stops around citations. Uh, as we all well know, it's only because of the work that the Washington Post and The Guardian has done that we have a centralized sense of how use of a force is being applied. We also you know, don't have any sense um, in terms of many demographic factors, how arrests and information based on ethnicity and, and arrests going back now um, pretty consistently for several decades. So in order to really understand the application, the spread and the impact of enforcement and diversion activities 
it's more broadly, we need to invest in figuring out what works best and continue to be experimental and creative in our approaches. And I would, you know, say that many of, uh, of the, the recommendations that we um, have been considering in terms of the, the role of police in reducing mass incarceration have begun to be experimented through the, the COVID reality. Uh, we're, we're seeing a huge amount of de-enforcement and reductions in arrest across the country. And in some instances, even a, a greater amount of information and policy setting and goals as it relates to how enforcement will and won't be applied and a measurement of the impact of, the, of, of, of that. Um, so in this moment, I think that there's a real opportunity to learn from the, the creative and pragmatic experimentation that was necessary to implement through the pandemic and to understand whether or not there are lessons learned that can help us improve and, and really to um, reduce the level of enforcement that's being applied nationally based on what we're learning from the COVID-19 crisis. So I appreciate you all giving me the, the opportunity to, to share my thoughts here. We're definitely eager to hear what the COVID de-enforcement reality looks like in your communities and happy now to open up the conversation to discussions and questions that uh, folks who have joined us online would like to pose. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, we do have a few questions. Um, the first one is, one of your recommendations to reduce mass incarceration is to rethink the 911 system. In New York City, in the early years of the Bloomberg administration, the city developed an alternative to 911, the 311 system. The thinking being that 911 would be the focus of reporting strictly criminal matters. What, if any, impact did the development of 311 play before the current mayor's office uh, efforts to reduce the number of individuals incarcerated um, have in any, if any, on incarcer incarceration rates in New York City or New York State? That is a great question. I, I, uh, I, I would have written it myself if it hadn't come in from one of the brilliant audience members. So, so thank you to whomever um, offered that question. You know, I think 311 and, and many jurisdictions also have 211 and other similar systems. I think they offer a lot of, of viability in, in terms of, of reducing this pathway to police enforcement over the long term. Unfortunately, we have not seen jurisdictions put resources behind their 311 and 211 systems in order to offer alternative deployment besides police. So having spent some time working um, in New York City, what I know is that um, in the year following the implementation of 311, uh, basically the NYPD was provided 1 million additional calls for service to respond to that just came in through another pathway. Um, and I think that that was a really unfortunate collateral consequence of 311 being put in as a, as a way to potentially reduce 911 calls coming in, but not uh, putting in the associated resource to, to, to find somebody who was more equipped to deal with some of those problems. And again, because I'm familiar with New York City, I can tell you that uh, around the time that 311 was implemented. One of the most frequently occurring calls to 911 and 311 was blocked driveways. Uh, I'd like to think that there's a, a better, more effective way to, to deal with somebody's driveway being blocked in New York City than calling the police. Police are a very expensive resource and not very well equipped to, to solve that problem other than essentially calling a towing company. Um, so I think there are lots of examples in which we might be able to use 911 and 311 in a way that actually includes other dispatch uh, resources that are deployed beyond just the police themselves. I hope that answers the, the, the question that was posed and 
I encourage uh, the, the individual who, who wrote it to, to please uh, ask an, another question or provide any other clarification that might be helpful. Okay, so our next question is, are there any jurisdictions in the United States that employ civilian enforcement mechanisms instead of armed police for certain offenses such as low-level traffic, liquor, minor ordinance violations, loitering, minor drugs, et cetera, et cetera, or who also restrict in a meaningful way the number of, quote, arrestable offenses? Uh, that's a great question. Also, thank you for that. Um, well, one of the biggest challenges, and this relates to, to recommendation number six, is that we really don't have a comprehensive sense of what's happening across the country and, um, and potentially a, a role that maybe NACOL and others could play going forward because it would be incredibly valuable to, to really have an, an inventory uh, uh, or a, a directory of, of what's happening where. Um, so I'll just give some examples of, of some, of some uh, alternatives that I'm aware of, but it, it by no means is this exhaustive and, and others may have, have, have other ideas to, to, to bring into this conversation. But the Tucson Police Department, for example, they have a, a suite of what they call community service officers or CSOs who are non-sworn, they do not carry a gun, they do not carry handcuffs, and they are deployed in order to respond to a number of kinds of uh, issues that come up through the 911 call for service system in that area. For example, they take accident reports, um, they go out and they, uh, they'll take um, house and business burglary reports when it's confirmed that no one is is in harm's way and that the the the, the premise is is empty and and in addition to those reporting functions they're also doing a, a key role in educating community members around prevention as many of us know if uh, an, an individual's home or business or even their car has been burglarized they're at an incredibly uh, increased chance of, of being victimized again uh, but many people don't know that and so one of the, the key roles that folks in these positions play is is helping uh, teach mechanisms to to target harden so it's not just about getting a report that you submit to your insurance company or um you know something of that nature but really trying to sort of educate about how to keep people safe in the long run um so there there are some some examples in which uh, non-sworn officers are being deployed in that way i'm not very familiar with agencies other than law enforcement doing that kind of work although i think that there's great potential for it I could imagine, you know, a health and human services kind of department being involved in 911 and 311 responses as they relate to mental health, behavioral health, things of that nature, um, and, and taking some of these calls in cases that uh, police are not really well equipped to respond to. I think that the second part of that question had to do with um, uh, policies or, or um, orders around uh, what what offenses would be arrestable or chargeable, um, uh, if, if I understood that correctly. And, and yes, there are a number of examples of, of jurisdictions um, that, that have uh, issued some pretty specific guidance, usually in the um, form of an executive order uh, or an operations order that's been issued by the police chief or superintendent in the jurisdiction, and they'll um, uh, operationalize, you know, what may be an arrestable offense, what won't be an arrestable offense, things of that nature. One example that I'll point to, although there are many, and this is an example in which I think there are a flourishing number of examples across the country in response to COVID. But the Camden County, New Jersey Police Department, I believe it was about two years ago, started to see um, through some relationships with oversight entities, and I believe the New Jersey Civil Liberties Union, 
some in, in, incredibly startling and disturbing statistics related to resisting arrest um, and that people of color were much more likely to be arrested for dis disorderly conduct and um, resisting arrest. And so the decision there was that if um, a police officer were going to make an arrest for one of those charges that they actually had to call their supervisor and a sergeant had to come onto the scene in order to approve that arrest and that it was warranted. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, arrests in those categories dropped significantly as a result. Um, there's another example that's um, described in the gatekeepers report uh, in Durham, North Carolina about um, how they, uh, as a police department, chose to deprioritize arrests of marijuana possession. Um, so we, we have uh, many examples of, of, of this, but again, no sort of like central repository uh, or best practices to, to pull from. Thank you, Rebecca. I think we have time for a couple more questions. Um, the next one is, are you aware of diversion mechanisms or programs that are successful? For example, is there data on recidivism, reduction of calls for service, reduction in costs, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, there, there's not, um, to my knowledge, and, and I encourage um, folks who, who may know uh, more than I and are on the call to, to, to point us to resources if I'm mistaken, but there, there's no such thing uh, to my knowledge in, in terms of like a meta-analysis. And what that means from a scientific perspective is that you take all of the research on a certain topic um, and you combine the results and then you can say, yes, this is effective or no, it isn't. Um, there's, the, to, to my knowledge, there's nothing like national that summarizes that for alternatives to enforcement, especially as it relates to reduced 911 calls for service. That being said, the Washington State Institute of Public Policy, um, they have a fantastic um, resource of a, a number of cost-benefit cost analyses um, that work off of meta-analyses that they've done and others have done that look at different kinds of diversion, some of which are included and, and referenced in the gatekeepers report. And some examples of that include um, like drug court diversion um, and things of that nature where they find a strong return on, the, on investment um, in terms of dollars spent on diversion programs, having a very strong return on reduced public safety and decreased uh, public expenditures on unrela other related justice system costs. Uh, so we think that there's a real strong basis to support this, this work going forward, but um, to, to my knowledge, we haven't seen the kind of, of research that the, the questioner is, is speaking of, and I, I think that uh, we, we very much need it. And, and I think that we would, would, if we can get some some studies out in the field, I think that we would, would see, I hypothesize that we would see those findings. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, next, one of the issues we've dealt with in our community is priming by people calling 911. For example, in the shooting of Tommy Lee, Callers told 911 that he had a knife. He didn't, but the narrative carried through. Knowing what bad witnesses we all are, have you thought about protections against priming like this? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and you know, and the, I think there's two sides, at least, of this coin. Um, there's priming, and then there are you know instances like most of us are familiar with in terms of like the barbecue Betty kinds of or barbecue Becky kinds of um, situations in which people are are calling for police intervention uh, and using the police uh, essentially as as a proxy to enforce their own biases. Um, you know, I don't think that we have a great solution for this, but what I will say is I think that not having evidence-based practices in place currently uh, when it relates to 911 call taking and dispatching puts us at a much worse situation uh, in terms of, of remediating this problem uh, because there are, are very 
uh, sort of fluid guidelines and how call takers uh, get information from callers uh, and, and we don't have sort of a standardized script or what um, on the fire taking side is often referred to as criteria based dispatching. Uh, we, we very often uh, are taking little pieces of information and, and making larger generalizations and assumptions that uh, play out in the field and sometimes put community members and officers in harm's way because we're not collecting the right information at the right time. Next, um, what about community policing? Hasn't it contributed to de-emphasizing arrests in favor of dealing with community issues before those issues become criminal problems? I think that community policing absolutely has that at its um, center and that there's the possibility for that to occur. But what needs to happen is that within an agency that prioritizes community policing, their incentive structures, um, and, and we talked about that through one of the recommendations, need to be fully in line with incentivizing those, those um, same kinds of priorities. Uh, and what um, sometimes is the case is that we have priorities that are at odds, where we'll have community policing officers, but agencies that are still prioritizing and rewarding enforcement. And unless uh, the, those sort of metrics and, and priorities are aligned, I, I think that we will not be able to fully achieve the goals of community policing. We'll continue with a couple more questions. Are there examples, any examples you could share about how COVID has resulted in de-enforcement by police officers? Yeah, and, and I'm really curious if there are folks on the, the line who have um, experiences to share from their jurisdictions. But yes, we are seeing a rapid decline from March to present day in the volume of arrests in, in most major U.S. cities, as well as in a number of other jurisdictions as well. Um, we will not be able to look at this in terms of like a national trend for another couple of years because unfortunately the, the sort of national aggregated data um, that relates to the person's arrested um, information that I that I shared at the beginning of the talk there's usually about a two-year delay on that however there are many jurisdictions across the country that are making their arrest statistics available on um, their department or city or county websites and uh, we, we are, are seeing uh, major decreases in arrest as well as in jail admissions uh, in, in, I would say, the majority of cities. Thank you. And then lastly, I'll just ask, is there a place that we can find more about this information um, and the report itself? Yes. Um, I, I think, and um, Jana or Kami, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think that there can be a, a link to, to this report specifically um, on the, the NACAL uh, website um, advertising this talk. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, th there are a number of, of different resources within the report that I think would be um, helpful to that question um, specifically one area of the report that I'll point to is that there is a, a center section that uh, focuses exclusively on alternatives to enforcement I think it's it, it's called a spotlight on alternatives um, and it gives a number of examples as well as uh, to what is the to our knowledge is the most um, up-to-date research on the topic Great. Well, I want to thank you, um, Rebecca, for joining us today and, and sharing this information with the oversight community. Um, I found it very valuable and seeing some of the comments that have come through while we've been having it, I know that I am not alone. Um, and I do apologize to all of you whose questions we did not get to today, but um, we'll make sure to forward those on and try to get some answers for you following the webinar. Um, but I do thank all of our attendees today for joining us as well. 
There will be a very brief survey sent to you following today's webinar. If you could please take a moment to fill that out, it will definitely help us as we move forward and prepare additional um, webinars this year. Our next webinar will take place on June 3rd when we'll, we will be welcoming Florence Finkel to present on making factual de determinations, applying legal standards, and reaching allegation outcomes. You can register for this event by visiting the NACOL website. Once there, click on the training tab and then webinars. With that, I thank all of and you. If I could... Yes. Oh, Cami, I just ask if, if you wouldn't mind just um, scrolling to the last slide on, in the slide deck um, and, and my email address is there. If anybody uh, wants to get in touch or I can be helpful, please feel free to reach out to me. And I just really appreciate all of the work that you all are doing in your communities. It's uh, the work of oversight is so important and needed. And I appreciate you taking the time to, to share with me this afternoon. Wonderful, Rebecca. Thank you again. We really appreciate, really appreciate your time and your knowledge. And we look forward to hearing from you again in the future and seeing all of our attendees back here again at our next event. Thank you. Everyone be well.